worship here at First United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Justin Elliott Lowe, and I have the honor of serving as one of the clergy here. Today we continue our series in hope. What does it mean to have hope, and how does hope transform our lives, not just for right now, but for our whole lives, long term? Later in worship, Pastor Susan will be sharing from the prophet Zechariah, and what does it look like to be a prisoner of hope? Our memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. We hear these words. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will fly up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be tired. They will walk and not be weary. So today, as we hope in the Lord, may our strength be renewed. May we stand and sing full voice, giving praise to God, as we sing our hymn. This morning's scripture readings come from the prophets, and I'm taking verses from three different prophets. First, from Zechariah, from whence our message uh, title comes. Second, from Jeremiah. And third, from the prophet Isaiah, which will hold our memory verse for today. So I'm reading first from Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 12. Return to your stronghold. O prisoners of hope, today I declare that I will restore you to double. And from the prophet Jeremiah, from the 29th chapter, verse 11. For surely I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans of your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. And lastly, from the prophet Isaiah, from chapter 40, verse 31, which is also our memory verse today. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh, dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, of all of our hearts, 
be acceptable to you, O Lord God, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. We've been uh, taking a look at a new worship series starting last week on finding hope in difficult times. And in the five weeks of this series, we are going to take a look at passages from each of the major sections of the Bible that speak to us about hope. I am also giving you a, a Bible verse uh, to use as a memory verse to commit to memory each week as a tangible way to hold on to the teachings of hope that are part of our Judeo-Christian faith. Last week, we began our series by taking a look at hope through the Psalms. Hope was believing that the future holds something better for us than the present. And the memory verse came from Psalm 40, verse 1. I put all of my hope in the Lord. We also took a look at the word hope in Hebrew also means wait, that we wait upon the Lord. And etymologically, we found that the word hope uh, also comes from the word rope. And so when we are at the end of our rope and we are holding on, we are called to trust and believe that God is on the other end of the rope and will never let go that God is present with us. We also took a look at a very important way of organizing the Psalms according to uh, a Hebrew scholar, Walter Brueggemann. And this uh, rhythm of life, as he applies it to the Psalms, also can be applied to our other scripture teachings as well. He said the Psalms and our lives are organized into three different aspects. The first being orientation, the time when everything is going well. There are then moments called disorientation, when there's something that throws us off kilter, it may be something of our own doing, or it may be something uh, that comes to us that we are totally unprepared for, and also something that we have no control of. And lastly, that there is a time of reorientation, of being able to be delivered, redeemed, and saved from our disorientation and brought to a new place. We find this cycle of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation something that is important to the prophets as well. And it is the prophets today that we turn our attention to and their message of hope. In the coming weeks, we will take a look at the message of hope in the Gospels, in the epistles known as uh, the letters, and then in the great book of Revelation, which is perhaps the greatest commentary and message of hope for our time. But as we take a look at the prophets uh, this morning, uh, we know that one of the ways that the prophets teach us about how God gives us hope is through other people. This last Sunday uh, was the most impressive of all of our uh, love and action food and hygiene drives in terms of outcomes. We had 1,156 items that were collected, bringing a total of almost 8,000 items that have been collected this summer and distributed to the Salvation Army and Grace Welcome Center as they reach out to people in Kenosha County in need. And for the people who receive these items, they are truly a sign and a gift of God's hope and love for another week. This hope and love comes to others through us and our neighbors as we participate and give out of our abundance. Now the prophet's message also came through a time of disorientation as many of uh, the people that we are serving in their lives. And sometimes that disorientation came to people because of their own doing, of their desire to think uh, more highly of themselves and to move away from God. Sometimes it was something completely out of their control, such as uh, being engaged in war with a neighboring uh, country or tribe. Sometimes it was a natural disaster that came to them, like the pandemic that we are facing right now. 
And it was during these times of disorientation that the prophets spoke words of hope. In our Hebrew scriptures, or the Old Testament, there are 16 prophets. Four of them are considered major, 12 minor. The major prophets, sometimes there's a disagreement among scholars of who they are, but generally speaking, the four major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And it isn't because they are more important than the other prophets or the minor prophets, just that their story and the pages that they occupy in the Hebrew scriptures are longer than the rest. But as we take a look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel uh, this morning, and then speak to Zechariah, the minor prophet from whom we've read from, I simply want to take a, a look at the history in which uh, they lived, in which they spoke to, and so do a Cliff Notes version of that history for you, so to speak. The time is 605 BCE, and the people of God are living in Judah or the southern kingdom. The Egyptians are ones who are in great power, and the Babylonians are the ones who are gaining in their power and seeking to be the dominant force in the region. In 605 BCE, there was a battle at Carchemish, which is on the border of Syria and Turkey, and one of the most important cities of the Near East. Babylon, of course, won that battle. Now, to put it in perspective, um, and taking a look at Babylon, Egypt, and Judah, um, Judah was part of this skirmish because there was a major trade route that went through Judah. But of course, it was uneven when they came uh, to battle and the size of the armies and who would win and who would lose and who could hold their own. Judah is, uh, there could be a 12 um, to 14 Judahs that would fit into the size and state of Wisconsin. Subsequently, there would be um, about 70 um, Judahs that would fit into Babylon and about 40 uh, Judahs that would fit into Egypt. And so Egypt was 40 times larger than Judah and Babylon was 70, 75 times larger than Judah. There was a king whose name is familiar who reigned at the time of 605 BCE and of this battle. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar and was probably known as one of uh, the greatest kings in the Bible. He's mentioned uh, over 26 times in eight uh, different books and he is one who had great ambition. Now, when battles were fought and won, one of the interesting things is that those who were in power often uh, were able to stay in place as uh, puppets of the greater king. And so Zedekiah uh, was um, the king of uh, Judah, and uh, was indeed beholden uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar. But during that time of history and from that time, oh, I'm sorry, Jehoiakim was actually uh, the king. Zedekiah came a little bit uh, later. Is that the Babylonians are growing in their strength and they are taking uh, the best, the cream of the crop of people to uh, be their advisors. And so four of those advisors that went to serve King Nebuchadnezzar are names that you're familiar with as well. Uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, became advisors to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now in 597 BCE, the Jews wanted to rebel. They had enough of this rule from Babylon, and so uh, they sought to do so. Uh, but the Babylonians came in, they plundered the temple, they took uh, the king, they took 10,000 of the leaders, including Ezekiel, 
who was not only a prophet and a major prophet, but a priest to the people as well. And so Daniel and Ezekiel both were under Babylonian exile during this first time, this first stage of the exile. Ezekiel ministers uh, to the people there for 26 years. And uh, back in Jerusalem, we find one of the other major prophets, the prophet Jeremiah. There it is that he's writing to the people who have been taken into exile uh, for 20 years. He's telling the people that they need to repent. And of course, they didn't like that message much. Some said that in two years, they would all come back to Jerusalem. But Jeremiah said, this exile is going to take a lot longer before God brings you home again. And so settle in, be good, pray for your enemies and your adversaries, marry among uh, the people you're going to be there for a while. In fact, you're going to be there for 70 years before God will deliver you and bring you home. Well, 10 years go by and the Jews again are quite anxious and they rebel again. Only this time, Babylon came back with even a greater vengeance. That story is recorded in 2 uh, Kings, and uh, we find the description of what happened in the 24th and 25th chapters. Here are some of the words that are written. Indeed, Jerusalem and Judah so angered the Lord that he expelled them from uh, the, his presence. Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon, and in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came with his army, all of his army, against Jerusalem. He laid siege to it and built siege works all around it. He burned down the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. All the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard also broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried out the exile that the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had defected to the king of Babylon, all the rest of the population. It is that Babylon came for this second round and took them all. And then he did something unspeakable. Instead of leaving the king in place, he took uh, the king and he brought the king's sons, the princess, and he killed them right in front of the king's eyes. And then he gouged out the eyes of the king and led the king blinded in chains to Babylon. Talk about a hopeless situation. The city and the temple were destroyed. There was no army. The king had been taken away and blinded. The king's sons had been murdered. There was simply no hope to be found anywhere. And so why is it that we turn to the prophets this morning? Why do we take a look at this story and their messages? Well, this story that I just offered the Cliff Notes version to you is perhaps the most important story in the Hebrew Scriptures. It influences the majority of books. Some say that 29 out of 39 books of the Old Testament include references or speak of the Babylonian exile. It is also important because every generation since this time of the exile has looked back to the story and has recognized themselves in it. And I think we too, if we pause for a moment, see ourselves in the story as well. That we can think of a time now or in the past when we too have been in exile when we too have recognized that we have felt hopeless in our situation, or we have wondered where God is and why is it that we don't hear God's voice 
or feel as if our prayers are being answered. It is this time of being in exile that this story speaks to and that the prophet's words of hope can give us strength and can give us comfort and guidance. Most often the prophets talked to the seasons of disorientation and in our history as well, even in the last 100 years of our uh, United States history, we can take a look at times in which we have been collectively disoriented. In the past 100 years, we've experienced world wars, regional wars, 9-11, multiple bombings and shootings, numerous uh, recessions, a Great Depression, and some talk now about the pandemic as being added to that list. We come and we recognize that there have been times, and even now, and we also know if we're honest with ourselves that there will be times again when we are in exile. In this particular time, if we just take a look at the statistics around us, we know that many are in exile. The statistics are is that one out of four are unemployed, is that the number of deaths from COVID-19 have reached almost 144,000 in our country alone, and over 4 million people as of today have been tested positively. We know that 20, there are 20 more deaths by suicide each day than there have been statistically for the last 10 years. We've been taking a look at violence in our larger cities, many reaching over a 100% increase over last year. NAMI reports that a one third of all Americans are feeling severe anxiety, one quarter depression, and the Kaiser Foundation reports that 56% of all adults have dealt with mental health issues in these last couple of months. And what we know is while we wish that this would be over, we pray that this pandemic would be over, we think that it might be over tomorrow. It will take some time. Many say that it will take about 18 years for the stock market to uh, bounce back, for our economy to return to a place where it is, for us to be able to feel what we felt in some sense of normalcy uh, just six months ago, 18 years not the 70 years of the people who were in exile. See, we cry out to God as the psalmist did and as the prophets did, that God might deliver us, and God will, but not immediately. It is a time in which God comes and works in and through uh, each of us that we might respond to the needs that are around us. Now, if we take a look at the messages or some of the highlights of the stories of the four major prophets, we know that Daniel is one of them. One of the major stories of Daniel is that he is not willing to stop praying to God. King Darius, uh, who is uh, above uh, Daniel, requires everyone to pray to him, and Daniel refuses. King Darius, as you know, says that he will uh, throw Daniel into the lion's den, which of course he does. But much to everyone's surprise, the lions don't seem to have an appetite, and Daniel's life is miraculously spared. The message of hope is that sometimes we too get thrown into the lion's den, but that God is with us 
as we trust and are steadfast in our relationship with him. Now Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, during the same time of Daniel, built this huge idol to himself, and he required that everyone would bow down whenever the trumpet was played before this idol. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were only willing to bow down before God, not when they heard the sound of the trumpet, and certainly not before King Nebuchadnezzar. And because they didn't uh, bow down before the idol, Nebuchadnezzar threw him into the fiery furnace. But you remember that story too from your childhood, don't you? That there was a fourth person that was in the fire with him, that fourth person of God. The message of hope is that sometimes we are tested Sometimes the heat is turned on high. Sometimes we are in the fiery furnace. But God will be with us, that God will not leave us. When we take a look at the prophet Ezekiel, we take a look at uh, his vision that he had when he was taken to the valley of the dry bones. And God says to Ezekiel, do you think that these dry bones can live again? And Ezekiel says to him, only you know, Lord. And God says, prophesize to the bones. And so as Ezekiel prophesies to the bones, those who died in Babylon, their bones begin to live again. As they are connected to each other, as the sinews grow on them, as they indeed get up and dance. But Ezekiel too says that God promises you to return to your homeland, but it is 30 years before they return. The story reminds us that it was that promise of God's deliverance that sustained God's people through all of those years. Think about some of the great spirituals that we have, that many who were slaves during a dark time in our history sang, sang about a hope of the future, that they may not live to the day that they are free, but it will be their children's children. It is that which kept them going and moving them forward knowing that someday there would be freedom, even if they did not experience it themselves. Last week, we lost a great civil rights activist, John Lewis, and he wrote these words, Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic, our struggle is not a struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. The promise of hope is also a promise of justice and restoration. A promise that may not come tomorrow or the next day, but one that we believe will come in the future because it is the way of God. Jeremiah is the third prophet that we have lifted up. And as we take a look at one of his most famous lines in all of his writings, it is one that is often quoted from the 29th chapter. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your well-being and not for harm, plans to give you a future with hope. And so often this passage is misquoted. So often it is a time when thinking that 
uh, it will be something that happens immediately or God micromanages our ever being. But we need to put the story of Jeremiah in context of how it is that he wrote letters for over 20 years to the people of exile. How he reminded them of a day that will be coming in which they will return home, but it will not be immediately. It reminds us that the pandemic is not the final word, just like any of our personal exiles are not the last word. Perhaps you are experiencing the exile of divorce or a loss of a child or loved one, of being unemployed or depression. But in the words of the prophets, and specifically Jeremiah, they are not the final word or the last word. That God has a plan. It may not be filled with minutia. It may not be a specific uh, letter and point plan, but it is a plan where God says that we are to love God and to love our neighbor and that we will be blessed and God will give us freedom. It is an overarching plan that our hope is not in the present, but in the future. And no matter how dark things are at the moment, it will not last forever. And lastly, we take a look at Isaiah. And we know that this pandemic and COVID has been changing almost everything about the way in which our healthcare system is working. When I was in Kenosha a few weeks ago, I stopped at uh, the Starbucks and as I was waiting for uh, my cold brew, the uh, person there who was at the window uh, waiting for my drink to hand it to me, um, asked me uh, how my day was going and where I had been. And so I shared with her that I was a pastor and I was just coming from a graveside service that I had done. And she began to tell me about her friends three-year-old who needed open heart surgery and how because of the pandemic is that the parents and the child were separated during the time of surgery and for the recovery. She said that it was unbearable to the parents and she can only imagine how frightened the child was. But she said that after the first hours and after the surgery was completed, is the parents could not speak highly enough of all the healthcare workers they met and the ways in which they overextended themselves to be parents to their child when they could not be in the hospital. They asked what their child's favorite songs were, what the favorite bedtime rituals were, and sought to implement those along with all of the measures we've heard, such as FaceTiming and others, to be able to connect people who are hospitalized with loved ones. They were so grateful, this woman at Starbucks said, for the healthcare workers who stepped in and did everything possible to be able to care for their young children during this incredibly difficult time and a one in which was executed in a way that none of us could have ever imagined six months ago. And so we come to Isaiah, who actually lived 125 years before the exile, but the last 26 chapters speak to it, which gives words to scholars who believe that there may have been more than one Isaiah who has written this book or who spoke to the people. And we find wonderful words of comfort to people who are disoriented and in distress, who are feeling like they are in exile. In the 40th chapter, we read the words of comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Words 
that are found in Isaiah, words that are sung by Handel's Messiah every Christmas and many other times of the year. There we find that there is a promise and to be able to return to the homeland. And these beautiful words toward the end of the 40th chapter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and he strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. And here's our memory verse for the week. But those who wait for the Lord, those who hope for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The message of the prophets is that God is walking with you. Hold on to him. Wait and hope in the Lord. Do not forget that he is with you. And when you feel like you might be fainting, know that God will pick you up and give you strength as, as the wing that comes under the wings of the eagles to lift us up. Life is hard, and indeed for some is harder than others these days, but it is definitely hard for all of us. And so we are reminded to return to the stronghold, as the prophet Zacharias said. Bishop Archbishop Desmond Tutu said that he was a prisoner of hope. From these very words of Zechariah that we began with in the scripture reading. And what did that mean? All those years that he was imprisoned, all those years of apartheid, he was held captive by the very hope of God, by the very promise that someday would be a different day and a new day that someday would be a just day and a day of reconciliation, that indeed that that help gave him strength and propelled him forward each and every day until that new day came. We are the ones who incarnate that hope of God by our very words and actions as we live being captives and prisoners of hope, as we participate in our love and action drive, as we hear the words of the prophet and hold on to them for ourselves, as we give thanks for all of our health care workers and such as those who cared for a three-year-old and their family. And so in these days, give hope to each other Receive the hope that God gives to you. Trust in him and receive his strength so that you might share that hope and love with one another. And as you do this week, just think of one person who may be struggling a little bit more than you are at this time and reach out to them. Be a friend. Share God's love and hope. Amen.
people of hope, as we take a deep breath and move into a time of prayer, I offer these prayers that have been shared with us this past week. A correction uh, for our prayers. A member, Jean Birch, her, her, her daughter, did fall and, and break her arm, but it was in a gymnastics class. It wasn't in an accident. But we continue to pray for that 10-year-old who is from Zion, who was hit on Sheridan Road and is still in a coma. We pray for a friend of Nancy Matthews, Jean, as he battles cancer. And a friend of the congregation, Sarah, who is 20 weeks along in her uh, pregnancy, a very difficult pregnancy. We pray as the doctors and, and nurses and those in the healing arts try to elongate her pregnancy as long as possible. We pray for, for Sarah and her family. We also pray for Marion Millsaps, who is in hospice care. And we pray uh, for two families of our congregation as we have experienced uh, two deaths, two people who have passed on to be with God. June Nelson passed away. We pray for the Nelson family as they grieve and celebrate her life, as they prepare to um, give thanks to God for a life well lived. The Nelson family will be having a private uh, family celebration. And also for the Kepler family, Kelvin Kepler passed away and is now in God's presence, fully in God's presence. Uh, Kelvin is the father to Bruce Kepler and Pat and grandfather to Scott. We pray for them as they grieve, as they continue to give thanks to God for another beautiful life. And they too will be gathered at, in a private a family service. We pray for um, all the people who are struggling this day struggling with direction of life, struggling with medical concerns for researchers and those who are looking for a cure for COVID-19 and for the people who are providing care to those who are affected. We pray, God, God of hope, that help will come soon. We'll move into a time of silent prayer after we use our breakthrough prayer and then I'll close us with a pastoral prayer and we can join together in the Lord's Prayer. But let us use this time as we pray the breakthrough prayer to then enter into a time of silent prayer for the God of hope is listening. Let us pray. God, let your love light the path you would have us travel. Empower us and grant us the courage to include all people in the work you would have us do. Amen. God, we do want to hope in you. We do want to put our trust in you, our faith. But to become vulnerable is difficult. To become vulnerable exposes us to the possibility that, God, you will not listen, or that the possibility that we have to wait longer, we have to long suffer. We want hope to happen now. We want relief now, God. We want answers now. Give us patience and endurance that we might become prisoners of hope, that we can wait however long it takes for good to happen. We can wait with a sense of, of patience and knowledge, knowing and trusting that you follow through, that you are true to your word. And as the spiritual says, you haven't let us down yet. We pray for all of the concerns we've lifted, the spoken and unspoken desires of our hearts, those that weigh heavily on us. We dance with joy to give you thanks for all the blessings in our life, especially the blessings of hope that we might hope in you, and that that hope will give us strength, God, so that we can continue to be your messengers of this hope, your proclaimers of peace, doers of justice, and proclaimers and livers 
and examples of love in action. I give you thanks, God, for all the people that participated in our love in action and for collecting over 1,000 items to bring hope to those in need. So bless our time of worship, bless our lives, and bless our times of waiting, God, that we might not lose hope, but it might be renewed in each one of us. As we pray the prayer Christ himself taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are thankful for all the ways that you and your friends and, and people connected to the congregation gave in love and action this past week. Now is the time of offering, and, and you can see that there's a tab for giving. There's also a tab for the connection card. Please fill that out in this time of offering, as well as provide your offering, your tithes. You can click on the link and follow the list. Go down to First Church Kenosha and put your amount in there. You can set that up again weekly, or monthly, or just a one-time gift. Know that your giving, all of our giving, is the tangible way that provides hope for the world, that allows God's hope to be made known and manifest in our world. So thank you. Please, please give with a sense of generosity and a sense of expectation that God's hope, God's hope will be here for the long term and that we can continue to be a beacon of light, love, and hope on 60th and Sheridan as we build a diverse community in God's radical love. Thank you. Thank you for the ways that you offer your gifts and talents, your tithes, your offerings, and your hope for the transformation of the world. As we take a deep breath and move into a time of prayer, I offer these prayers that have been shared with us this past week. A correction uh, for our prayers. A member, Jean Birch, her, her, her daughter, did fall and, and break her arm, but it was in a gymnastics class. It wasn't in an accident. But we continue to pray for that 10-year-old who is from Zion, who was hit on Sheridan Road and is still in a coma. We pray for a friend of Nancy Matthews, Jean, as he battles cancer. And a friend of the congregation, Sarah, who is 20 weeks along in her uh, pregnancy, a very difficult pregnancy. We pray as the doctors and, and nurses and those in the healing arts 
try to elongate her pregnancy as long as possible. We pray for, for Sarah and her family. We also pray for Marion Millsaps, who is in hospice care. And we pray uh, for two families of our congregation as we have experienced uh, two deaths, two people who have passed on to be with God. June Nelson passed away. We pray for the Nelson family as they grieve and celebrate her life, as they prepare to um, give thanks to God for a life well lived. The Nelson family will be having a private uh, family celebration. And also for the Kepler family, Kelvin Kepler passed away and is now in God's presence, fully in God's presence. Uh, Kelvin is the father to Bruce Kepler and Pat and grandfather to Scott. We pray for them as they grieve, as they continue to give thanks to God for another beautiful life. And they too will be gathered at, in a private a family service. We pray for um, all the people who are struggling this day struggling with direction of life, struggling with medical concerns for researchers and those who are looking for a cure for COVID-19 and for the people who are providing care to those who are affected. We pray, God, God of hope, that help will come soon. We'll move into a time of silent prayer after we use our breakthrough prayer and then I'll close us with a pastoral prayer and we can join together in the Lord's Prayer. But let us use this time as we pray the breakthrough prayer to then enter into a time of silent prayer for the God of hope is listening. Let us pray. God, let your love light the path you would have us travel. Empower us and grant us the courage to include all people in the work you would have us do. Amen. God, we do want to hope in you. We do want to put our trust in you, our faith. But to become vulnerable is difficult. To become vulnerable exposes us to the possibility that, God, you will not listen, or that the possibility that we have to wait longer, we have to long suffer. We want hope to happen now. We want relief now, God. We want answers now. Give us patience and endurance that we might become prisoners of hope, that we can wait however long it takes for good to happen. We can wait with a sense of, of patience and knowledge, knowing and trusting that you follow through, that you are true to your word. And as the spiritual says, you haven't let us down yet. We pray for all of the concerns we've lifted, the spoken and unspoken desires of our hearts, those that weigh heavily on us. We dance with joy to give you thanks for all the blessings in our life, especially the blessings of hope, that we might hope in you, and that that hope will give us strength, God, so that we can continue to be your messengers of this hope, your proclaimers of peace, doers of justice, and proclaimers and livers and examples of love in action. I give you thanks, God, for all the people that participated in our love in action and for collecting over 1,000 items to bring hope to those in need. So bless our time of worship, bless our lives, and bless our times of waiting, God, that we might not lose hope, but it might be renewed in each one of us. As we pray the prayer Christ himself taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are thankful for all the ways that you and your friends and and people connected to the congregation gave in love and action this past week. Now is the time of offering, and, and you can see that there's a tab for giving. There's also a tab for the connection card. Please fill that out in this time of offering, as well as provide your offering, your tithes. You can click on the link and follow the list. Go down to First Church Kenosha and put your amount in there. You can set that up again weekly or monthly or just a one-time gift. Know that your giving, all of our giving, is the tangible way that provides hope for the world, that allows God's hope to be made known and manifest in our world. So thank you. Please, please give with a sense of generosity and a sense of expectation that God's hope, God's hope will be here for the long term and that we can continue to be a beacon of light, love, and hope on 60th and Sheridan as we build a diverse community in God's radical love. Thank you. Thank you for the ways that you offer your gifts and talents, your tithes, your offerings, and your hope for the transformation of the world. And now as our time of worship comes to an end, I invite you to stand to receive a blessing, a blessing of hope. As we move into our lives of service, receive these words. Now go, go and be messengers and prisoners of hope. Go and renew your strength by hoping in the Lord, by living love and justice and peace in our words and actions so that all might come to know of God's great love. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Alleluia.